Yes. Okay, no. now. Okay. Forget. Over this over is there. a history lesson. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. So. Latte? Yeah, latte. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, habla español. Ah. Yeah. Español es mi segundo idioma. <laughs> Pero, yeah. So you can, so you yeah. can survive in, in uh, Oh, very easily. I, I can survive in... I, I also speak German and... No, 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 and, no. no. So I, I, but but here, I think, oh, here, there are places that, that I can tell you I survive better with Spanish than with English. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> it's, it's, it's weird. I mean, like, it's just now, it's interesting. I just said to the gentleman, I didn't look at him, mm -hmm. I don't know what mm -hmm. he, his language is, I had no idea. He could be from India, uh -huh. but he served me coffee. I said, gracias. Yeah. Uh -huh. because oh, yeah. He served me coffee. Uh -huh. And he said, de nada. Uh -huh. And it, it just, uh -huh. and it, 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 it just, is part of the, it's just part of the language. Yeah. So, you know, Portuguese. So if you think so San Francisco, that's a Spanish it's name, that's right. it's called the Spanish word so here. Going back probably. To Spanish, yeah. So, now, it, the history lesson. <laughs> the reason that Stanford and Berkeley are different ecosystems is not because of a linear progression mm -hmm. of history. It's because of a parallel progression of history. Mm -hmm. And it anchors on the Second World War. And it still lives. It's that, as you know, Silicon Valley is based on federal research funding. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as you know, that federal research funding changed policy in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. You know this, right? You no, don't know no, no, that I don't. You sure. should know yeah. this. This is fundamental. Yeah. This is what you're uh -huh. seeing. Right. Uh -huh. Everything you're seeing is through the lens of policy that was established in the Second World War. Before, and this is well documented. Uh -huh. Before the Second World War, federal research was done in federal labs right and and the IT was owned uh, and the IP was owned by the federal government mm -hmm. in the second world war a wise gentleman made the observation that we should leverage all of academia and Rather than trying to make academics work for the federal government, mm -hmm. we should sponsor research in the universities without mm -hmm. removing people from their place of living and work. Mm -hmm. That's where federal funding mm -hmm. of research changed. Now, the research and conducted... So then they were basically uh, teaching. There was a segregation between federal research, mm -hmm. government research, and academic research. Mm -hmm. We wanted to win the war. Mm -hmm. We wanted all resources deployed against a war. A, this was a world war. All efforts were deployed against the war. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right. So Stanford had already established uh, right here's Henry. No, that's not Henry, no. I'm wrong. I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. He'll probably have a scarf. Yeah. He usually has a scarf. Okay. And already made progress in microwave. Uh -huh. And this led to electronics and radar and there's Henry. I see it. Let's see, he has a scarf. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good to see you. Great to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> I am sort of too big for this thing, but let me okay. watch. Well, just let me, oh, uh, let's be first. Bathroom around the corner. So, all right, come. On. <laughs> let me finish my yeah. my history lesson. All right. So the electronics, the 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 science that was leveraged most. That was at Stanford, mostly leveraged there. Turn, you know, you know the history, Tenerman, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, okay. 
the, the dean of the engineering but school. All, but, but most of the inventions are happening here at Berkeley, stop. right? Stop! No, 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 stop! Don't stop with okay. this comparison, okay. like most and least. No. It's not okay. relevant. Okay. It's different. This competition thing, drop it. Mm -hmm. It's destructive. Mm -hmm. What's important to know is what was at Berkeley was physics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was it at, to simplify, what was it at Stanford was electronics. Mm -hmm. So they were more applied already? In no. No? Wrong. 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 What are they applied to? Physics is applied to the atom bomb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's capital intense, highly secret. All right, yeah. and it get and they establish since it's the war is going to depend on the outcome of the atom bomb. They establish the Salamos National Labs, and they remove scientists from Berkeley, and they go from all over the world to Los Alamos, mm -hmm. and they build the bomb. It takes years. The culture that builds is one of secrecy and one of closed mm -hmm. innovation. Mm -hmm. Okay where the electronics has very short cycle life. So at the end of the war, the IP is not as valuable because it... Hello. Oh. <laughs> so the IP has a shorter life cycle. Where the IP on nuclear physics is, is more, more secret, but also has a longer life cycle. Mm -hmm. It's like biotechnology has a longer life cycle. So Berkeley's strengths have been physics and biotech, and biotech which have a different life cycle of IP mm -hmm. and much more capital intensity than mm -hmm. electronics. Now Berkeley, has, tech or? now Berkeley has very suburban electronics and all that and all the guys, you know, you know, I can tell you all the things we did in software and all that. But all that is much more like, um, you know, the, and that's what bridges us mostly to Silicon Valley Classic. This guy knows nothing my, about the history I, 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 I'm of science in the Bay Area. <laughs> Good to see you. I'm getting the history. I'm getting the history. I know. A history lesson right now. No, but that's why. I see. The, I'll just finish his thought. Sure. That's why I, I mean, I, we're having a discussion about Berkeley Stanford. Yes, sure. and, he, and he was doing the, oh, well, Stanford was earlier, and I'm just saying, not earlier or less, we got to drop the competition and recognize the difference in the culture. Yes. And that Berkeley's culture drives off yes. of physics, you know, and the, and the secrecy and the in and the closed innovation around the atom bomb, where Stanford derives, of course, from electronics and microwave and radar and all that, which yeah. is a shorter life cycle and then led to a more open innovation cycle, you know, under the great leadership of the engineering school, etc. But that's why the cultures are different. That's why the Berkeley culture uh -huh. here, we were just looking at this, fragmented. Yes, it's yes, fragmented. Yes, it's such yes. a chaotic uh -huh. ecosystem. Because it's mostly driven from the outside in mm -hmm. rather than the inside out. Yeah. And when I say outside in, I mean the students. Uh -huh. the, the students have created 90% mm -hmm. of this mm -hmm. rather than the institution saying, we ought to do it. Uh -huh. Okay. And then faculty followed and said, oh, well, if students want to do it, well, of course, we'll help them do it. Uh -huh. But the faculty that followed were largely adjunct faculty or not the lecturer faculty or guest faculty, not the core research faculty. And the course research faculty are the laggards in terms of, at least at Berkeley, in terms of adopting the institutional uh, perspective. Is it okay if we keep recording of this? Yeah, doing yeah, I'm doing it. As usual, I can't get my work that I want. <laughs> No, I'm doing. He, he was saying, no, you should take notes. And I said, don't worry. You don't know how many times I will listen to this afterwards. <laughs> it's just we will curse all day long. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll keep those out. All right. okay, you will not replay that. <laughs> no. so how are you? Uh, I'm good. And what I'm are good. you doing? What am I doing? Well, I'm working with this guy to follow up on the project we did at Stanford to look at the quote innovation system there. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, uh, I had a seminar on that back in 17, and uh, it worked out really beautifully. Undergraduates with a core, but then I had these amazing people from this wellness uh, program in the medical school 
senior executives and people pay fifty thousand a year. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah okay, yeah. you know this kind of yeah, deal. Yeah. So several of them discovered the seminar and they joined, mm -hmm. and they added on an amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. So did you have this Brazilian guy? Oh, Brazilian. Yes. Yes. Brazilian, the Fabio. Uh, no. Yeah, no, it, the, no, stop. No. Okay. Uh, let me get the oh, name. Um, uh, Betty. Um, Betiol, you're talking about yes, Bonnie Betiol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, the guy who was CEO of Betiol. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. My oh. good friend. I'm thinking, I'm just getting his middle name, Betiol. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's Bonnie Betiol. Bonnie, 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 yes, Bonnie, yes, yes. My good friend, Bonnie. Okay. Your good friend, yes. Bonnie. Yeah. He was one of the members of the seminar. He has yeah. such a, he loves that seminar. Yes, yes. He was, I mean, he came to me, uh, I think my gateway is often, this venture capital course I teach, mm -hmm. the executive course. And many people come, uh, Walney, you know, very wealthy, very established, yeah. Brazilian. Walney and I went to school together, so. Wonderful. <laughs> that's, that's, right. yeah, 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 that's how we met. And, oh, well, and, then, and then they come to my class and blah, blah, blah. And many of them, not many, but every once in a while, like Walney, they're like, I'm changing my life, you know, and I want to move yeah. Yeah. my family and whatever. So, um, so Walney immediately you know, bought this home or rented, whatever he did on the hill. He rented a place. Yeah, his big place. But he, when he linked up, he got. He was looking for a place to give a home, you know, for him to put his soul, right? And and I had nowhere for him to put his soul. You know, I had a little course here, a little course here. And he found this thing at, at Stanford, like change your life with us. Yeah. You know, it's wellness thing. <laughs> we loved it. Yes. Yes. We loved it. So that sent a great group of people into the yeah. seminar. And so I had written in the uh, course prospectus that we we're going to publish the results. Now I had in mind, you know, we go into an undergraduate uh, type journal. But with this, uh, these teams now were made up both of the kids and these senior people. So they brought in papers that were much higher level. Okay? And so uh, I decided to go for regular journals. Now, on the other hand, they weren't quite ready for regular journals, so they were missing literature type stuff. Yeah. So. Order or? Uh, yeah. Well, what we're just this? looking into this. This is a lot. To... I'll have one of those. Uh, start with. You, you know, they, make it, make it. Two. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and uh, let me tell you, look at the menu for a second. Look at the menu. Are you, are you gonna, do you want to eat? I'm sure. gonna eat. Yeah. Okay. Sure. See here. Look at the menu. Yeah. And let, you don't want the wine list. You yeah. want the. Yeah. So we ended on PhDs and postdocs. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, so we had an invitation yeah, from uh, David Teese, the publisher in his uh, managerial yeah. economics and decision making yeah, yeah, journal. Yeah, a good journal. Yes, yeah, so we have a, an article in there that came out some months ago now and went in technology forecasting and so forth. How did I not know? I did not know any of this. Okay, and no, then no. there's a piece under review in uh, Minerva, synthesis Wonderful. piece. Wonderful, So, and there's still some uh, materials left over yeah. for another round to add on to uh, on uh, IDEO. There's someone who went uh, out of the university. What could be better? Yeah, and it, exactly, exactly. So, uh, we're Congratulations. Go, yeah, we're going to see if we can get this, uh, it's an out, it was an outlier in the Stanford STS curriculum. Okay, yeah. which is not focused on innovation, not, it's not disallowed, yeah. but it's an outlier. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, all I've ever taught is outliers. <laughs> yeah, as well as as well as I was an outlier because their program is based on the regular faculty just relabeling You're, courses. From one outlier to another. Right, right. right. <laughs> Here, no, we gotta get that right. Right. Here, yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, it didn't doesn't fit the regular model, yeah. but uh, how yeah. they wanted to get this in, and so it was done as an experiment. Yeah. Now, we're negotiating to see if we can put it on a regular basis. Oh, but it's, it depends if there's a new person coming in. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. see, we'll see. And Who also knows? you need the inputs from this you know, program. That program at the health center may not be as you know, robust. No, that's, that's robust. Oh, it is. Okay. Oh, that's robust. It's done by the former dean of the medical school. Uh, uh, it uh, was informal at first, but yeah. now they, the students have status as sort of non-matriculated graduate students. Wow. So they don't have to only uh, beg to get in, they have a right. Yeah. Now, so that's, that's, that's set. And that's a natural collaboration to continue. So to see if uh, STS would like to broaden itself. Yeah. The good news is that uh, for a long time, STS was 
burgeoning, growing up. Now it's leveled off and started to decline, which is great news. Why? Be because whenever there's a decline and a crisis, people open to doing new <laughs> things. To, to innovation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When they're going, well, why change? Yeah. Okay, that was the original reaction I got when I was in Stanford in 0405 when yeah. I first met you yeah. from the Dean of Research who brought yeah. me in and I told him their whole tech transfer is accidental, getting great results but nothing systematic. And he decided it was not broken. Why yeah. fix okay, I said it's working well, make it better. Mm -hmm. And of course it, the students, just yeah. like you were saying, it was the students who came along and said there were huge gaps. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we needed help, we need something more systematic. And they organized Start X, yeah. and the faculty did a bunch yeah. of things, Spark, yeah. and now you have this whole yeah. whole innovation system yeah. uh, that was there for us to study. Yeah. Right. Whereas before it was just OTL. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, and OTL. So I'm okay. Uh, that's another topic. Exactly. But yeah, but that, I. We all know of the stories, right? It's another story, <laughs> and that's a whole other area for right. you. Yeah. Uh, you know. But it's, it's so let me tell you what to have here, okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just uh, eggs of anything you want. If you're an egg person, fine. If you want egg whites, fine. They have it. But it's sort of it's sort of like a, uh, you know, it's sort of like like a Spanish omelet is a great thing to have. Here. You know what I mean? It's sort of like this is a cafe. You know, it's like hamburgers. It's not. This is this is like a, a Greek. Yeah. Uh, thing in New York. Yeah, it's like uh, this. one of the classic cafes. Almost disappeared now in New York. Yeah, yeah. You're from New York, huh? Yeah. I should have known that. Uh, so when did you come out here? I well, I was coming out here from the mid '80s on research grants yeah. to do studies. Yeah. So I come out periodically. Then I came in 0405 to do the study of OTL yeah. for a year. For the year. But when they said uh, it's not broken, I took uh, this uh, offer to take uh, a chair at Newcastle University in the UK, yeah. where I set up a whole research program, a PhD program. Yeah. We got a lot of European Union grants. Yeah. But then my uh, rabbi, who sponsored me there, the deputy VC, he was finished. He didn't. He was short guy, yeah. brilliant guy, but no way they were going to make him yeah. the vice chancellor. Right. Okay. <laughs> so with him gone, I didn't see the point in staying there. And so I uh, applied here to come back to the Clayman Institute of Gender Research. I have this whole other line of work on gender, women in science. Timing was perfect. Yes. And so I came back for that year uh, at Clayman, and then I decided to stay on. And I went to my original sponsor here, the Dean of Research, and he put me in the... Uh, oh. yeah, yeah, let me just ask, do you have a, for any of your burgers, do you have a gluten-free bun? No, sorry. No, you don't, okay. I haven't looked at the menu yet. I'm gonna have a... Um, they're not ready. What's the, what's the soup for? Uh, let's see. It's That's the wine chow. menu. Okay, oh. <laughs> Hmm? Clam chowder and broccoli cheddar. Okay. Uh, oh, here's the, the regular lunch menu. Okay. Do you, do you have a deal where you have a, a soup and a part of a sandwich deal? Uh, you can sub the fries for soup. Instead of the price. Oh, instead of the price. Okay. So how about... Uh, but that's only for the sandwiches, if you want to order sandwiches. This is a sandwich? Is this a sandwich? Uh, yeah. So it can yeah. work for that? Yeah. Okay. There you go. There you go. Yeah. And you want this one, right? The yeah. Yes. Uh, I guess I'll just go for this, the, yeah. the, wild, uh, the wild one here. The, the one with mushrooms, yeah. The summer mushrooms. What is Linguica? Uh, Portuguese. Portuguese. Linguica is uh, yeah. actually the same. Right oh, here. Yes, thank you. Linguica is, is actually sausage, so they have the word sausage twice. 
I don't want the Hollandaise. I want the Hollandaise on the side. Would, would you still also recommend it? Or or when Bonnie came here, he came oh, first to his birthday, and then they went and tried to serve it up. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I know that he he had been here. Before, yeah. but in, yeah. in other who, who, uh, 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 Vone, uh, well, you call him Vone, right? Vone. Yeah, I call him Vone. Yeah. 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 So also, how do you say it in Portuguese? Vone. Vone. It's, it's, Vone. It sounds like a V to us. Oh, I'm surprised it mixed up. So you went to class school with him. So do you see him? I see. Yeah, I see I, him. I, we went to a basketball yeah. game. I haven't seen him in six months. He's, he's actually. Uh, Is he he may be right here. Now? He may be. No, he may be here this week. Oh, really? If, Oh, if he's around, we, we, we were thinking about if, if he's here, we we're thinking about inviting him to have dinner with us. Maybe I'll call the two of you. And yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> great. So, um, great. but his son was applying his, for school. His Berkeley. son is yeah, but I, I don't. I, well, I don't know if he applied for Berkeley. He didn't get Berkeley for sure. Yeah, he, yeah. he got another. Well, he, he didn't. I think he didn't. A well, he did some extension course something. there or something. Yeah, so that's what it was. Yeah, that's yeah, what something. he did. Yeah, yeah. And now he's doing a master's here in in San Francisco oh, somewhere. That's right. Yeah. He wrote me. I, I just yeah. So what can I? Let's business. What do you? I, I want to catch up, but what do? What can I do right now? Okay, for you? right now we're really looking at Berkeley as a second mover. In the it's, whole, you'll, you'll get him. You'll get okay, him. Okay, fine. <laughs> we, we, okay, look, we, that's we, how it's going to look in, to the outside world. We it know will. it's a different, deeper story. Yeah. But I'd like to just go on from what you're saying about the students taking the lead. Yeah. Like, that's important yeah. uh, I to don't, get on the record. I, I showed, I showed and, him this and he wanted look, to tear this apart. <laughs> in, look, when we met in 0506, you told me you were starting up the course at Haas. You had an assistant. You were introducing entrepreneurship. You were in a history lesson. Education. So yeah. what happened since then? Uh, the truth? Yes. The I don't truth. want to tell you but, the but, truth. But notice, but, but we'll, we'll publish the truth. <laughs> the, the ideas. I don't want to tell you the truth. It's ugly. So, but tell us what the students we'll do. Go back to yeah. where you were with the students. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you a story, okay? And I'll, I'll, it's like doing a case study. You know how you do a case study? You do a case study, you say, well, there's the truth, and there's what I'm willing yeah. to let be published. Sure. Um, the tr okay, th th here's the truth, and it's it, and this is absolutely the truth because here's what's relevant. I'm going to tell you my story. Okay, so I came to Berkeley in 1990, and I so old, and so I was an out true outsider. I'm not an academic. Okay, so this is You're fundamental. Coming from industry, right? I'm coming from industry. DC. Yeah, I, I was a EY. I was a senior partner at Ernst and Young. Okay, you know, you know, big accounting yeah. firm, right? Right, right. And I had specialized at that accounting firm in serving high-tech businesses. And not just high-tech, but uh, the real, there, there are two tiers in high-tech. Mm -hmm. This is relevant to you, because this makes it a global story. There's the inside the tornado high-tech where everybody knows everybody, and the venture funding happens relatively easily because it's all... They're all connected. They're all connected, right? I didn't really serve that inside the tornado. I had a firm, my firm was called Arthur Young. I'm sorry to take you back to ancient yeah. history, but this is relevant. Okay. I remember them. Okay. Arthur Young, there was eight large international okay. firms. Arthur Young was a second tier firm. This is important yes. in that it wasn't Anderson or Pricewaterhouse, right? Those were the big ones. Uh, KPMG, uh -huh. Pete Barwick at the time was going. So those firms being the largest could have the premier accounts and compete for them. When you competed for those large accounts, I'm really taking it through ancient history. Yeah, no, but what happened was it degenerated to accounting being a commodity and so the price it was price competition mm -hmm. now there was huge transaction costs and switching costs right because of the inference of uh, changing your account you inferred oh something was wrong mm -hmm. in the 70s though I'm sorry new independence rules came into the industry that forced at least a transition of the managing executive, we call it the managing partners, on an account. 
for independence. So if I was handling an account for more than three years as a senior person, I would get close to the management. And because of certain bad legal things that had happened, they said, no, we have to have people changing all the time. Once you change the senior people, it began to filter down to maybe as long as we're changing the senior person, we should open it up to competition. Once that became acceptable practice, like that a Pepsi-Cola or a Coca-Cola, who these firms had the same accounting firm, Pepsi-Cola's had the same accounting firm for 130 years. That's part of their thing. Once it became acceptable that they might open and change your accounting firm without any tarnish on them, it, these firms became price competitive. Mm -hmm. So these firms found that their reliable clients that paid them $5 million, $10 million a year at the time, all of a sudden would compete on price and they would slash their prices from $10 million to $2 million a year and actually operate at cost or below to secure the account. They were under competitive economic crisis. I'm sorry to tell you all this. In 1976, 77, I was tapped. I was a junior executive. I was tapped. I was in an elite group of junior executives in, in KPMG. So you're an accountant by background training. I, I'm an accountant out of Wharton, whatever. Uh, Post-Vietnam, hired to... Uh, came out of the Army, went back to Wharton. You know, a real American story, right? Uh, go into the accounting profession, have a good career, but I find myself where I... And by the way, just to show you about outliers, because outliers is important. This whole story is going to be about outliers, okay? Uh, you, I was an outlier in my firm. You know, this is a traditional path, but I was a Vietnam, you know, type of rebellious type, <laughs> even though I'd gone through the army thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was rebellious within my firm, so they gave me the outlier opportunities, which were very good. Mm -hmm. But so they... Uh, 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 nominated me to be a professor or whatever lecturer at a, a traditionally black university in the south in the 70s this was you know in its uh -huh. day uh, yes. an unusual thing to do yes. so i went to north carolina central for a year and i was having the time of my life teaching accounting uh in this very diverse not that very, very unique setting right and and for a white firm they thought i was doing great <laughs> service. Yes. I thought I was having a ball. <laughs> and uh, they then elevated me to be in all these unique roles. So I got this unique role. Oh, I, They also brought me in to do in-house training. Yeah. You know, executive training internally. Whatever. So uh, I got to be the bag carrier, the junior person on a very senior strategy study done by only three people, myself and two very senior executives, where I wrote the report, where we went around and spent almost a year doing an internal analysis of where profitability was within the firm. And this wasn't an analytical study, it was a really a study by interview. It was really getting out of the building yeah. and doing interviews. And we discovered that the profitability of the firm really rested on having long-lived accounts that came from organizing a company in the early days mm -hmm. and working with it over 50 years. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't fighting, you didn't make money by fighting for large accounts, but you built large companies. Therefore, I was given the opportunity to help found a practice for private company creation. And this is the 70s. So I did that for KPMG as a junior executive, mm. then I sent back to an operating office, Philadelphia, where I did it in a small business way. Mm. I moved to the West Coast as part of a change of life for me in the 80s. Right. In order to do that, I had to quit one firm and join another. Mm. So I joined AY, which is a second tier okay. firm, yeah. but had an extraordinary high-tech practice. Mm. This is inner volcano, inner yeah. tornado yes. practice. And companies that were start they had, they, had, they had Apple, they yeah. had Genentech, they had Raychem, they had the Intel. They yes. had 70% of the technology practice. The second tier firm had 70% of the high tech practice because the other large firms were ignoring it. Mm -hmm. And so people before me had actually caught that uh -huh. thing. They brought me in as a junior guy saying, well, we do this thing very well, this tornado thing. They didn't call it tornado, but whatever. We have all these great relationships, but there's more out there. There must be more to do. So they did. They just 
allowed, they, moved, they moved me out here and gave me no clients. They essentially said, you have six months, see what you can do. They didn't tell me I had six months, but I had six months, see what you can do. So I began to work the second year. In other words, not people who were inside the tornado, but people who were good entrepreneurs who were like trying to figure it out. Sure. And I used the connectivity to the tornado as a way to make introductions and facilitate. <laughs> so at the end of uh, 12 years... But what I, kind of firms were these, for example? Oh, they were everything. Mm-hmm. In the beginning, I, I, I would talk to anybody. Mm-hmm. And they were from ordinary, uh, like small businesses, to all of a sudden, two guys and a dog, you know, with an oh, idea. Yeah, okay. right? Like, for example? Autodesk. Okay. 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 <laughs> right? Yeah. I sat and organized yeah. Autodesk, right? Yeah. yeah. And I was there the day that ten guys sat around the table, and we went to a lawyer's office, and everybody mm-hmm. put in fifty thousand dollars, and I put in fifty thousand dollars worth of services for free. Right. I said free services, fifty thousand dollars. Everybody else put in checks. <laughs> everybody else got equity. They offered me my 10% of the company, or 11, 1 11th of them, and I said, no, 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 I don't take equity. I take a lifetime commitment <laughs> to, and it's still, okay. you know, a, an account, a, a client of the firm, I'm sure they charge you right. $20 million a year. I don't know that number, but yeah. some, some number like yeah. that, I'm sure. Yeah. So, um, but, and I built my practice that way. So after 12 years, I was a managing partner, in, not the managing partner, but I, I managed 25% of the billable hours in the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. I was one of four national leaders mm-hmm. in the whole country yeah. of this area. And I, my career was set. Mm-hmm. And um, then AY merged with EY, mm-hmm. E-E-W, yeah. Ernst yeah. & Winnie. Yeah. Uh-huh. And in that merger, what they did was they said, okay, you're great at this, but Jerry, you're in San Francisco. The place we're going to, the way we're going to do that is let San Jose and Palo Alto uh, do that high tech stuff, mm-hmm. and San Francisco will be financial services. Yeah. I didn't want to move mm-hmm. San Jose or Palo Alto. Right. I live here in Marin sure. County. Yeah. I said, no. <laughs> they gave me an honorary title, National Director of Capital Resources, mm-hmm. so I could travel around the country and help people raise venture capital, do what I did. Right. But I had no operating role, and I used to have 125 direct reports, mm-hmm. in other words, billable hours. Yeah. That's what power is in that yes. So I no longer had power in that way. I had a title and a budget, but it, it you know, was not going to mm-hmm. be very interesting yeah. for me and um, so I was looking for an exit mm. and I would talk to one gentleman at the University of California who was a lecturer mm-hmm. and but a donor yes and, and who had <laughs> created the first entrepreneurship course Who's so this? Leo Helsel mm-hmm. together back, back well he created it back in I would I'm gonna guess the year 1983 84 mm-hmm. yeah yeah I created this course in partnership with Dick Holt, who was the dean. Mm -hmm. So he had the dean as his Mm co-instructor, and this was a model that I I believe in yet to today. You have a tenured, you know, a real academic partnering with a practitioner. You know, this is the same model that started at Stanford. Yeah, well, of course. uh, What's his name? Yeah, but it follows Timmons, though. Timmons at Harvard, who went, Timmons leaves Harvard to go to, um, begins with a B, uh, you know, the small... Uh, uh, ba- uh, ba- Babson. Ba- ba- Babson. Babson. Timmons, Babson. Babson that is became Babson. the entrepreneurship. Babson yeah. is Babson yeah. because of Timmons. Mm-hmm. And, and he gets, doesn't get enough respect. Mm-hmm. But Timmons is a big gun at... I go to visit Timmons, Jeff Timmons, at his office, at Howard Stevens' office. You know how Harvard is. You go in, there's a secretary, and there's one... Yeah. So there, <clears throat> Howard Stevens and Jeff Timmons, all in one place, right? And you're like, and I go in, and, and they're very different people. Jeff was a, not a young man on the make, but he was on the way up, and, mm. and Howard's sort of like, you know, <laughs> Howard, he's wonderful, and he's there. Um, but Howard wrote the textbooks of the 80s, right? So he's, you know, he wrote these dense textbooks. Mm-hmm. We're, on entrepreneurship. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on entrepreneurship. I and mean, he's, a, you know, uh, the pursuit of entrepreneurship. Uh, entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity mm-hmm. beyond the resources you have under your control. That's yeah. Howard Stevens. Uh-huh. And, and Jeff writes like a manual. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? He, Red, Jeff has the, the triangle of opportunity, resources, and um, team. Mm. That's it. Yeah. I, I, or money. Whatever it is. Yeah. He has his try. He has a yeah. method. He has a yeah. thing. Uh-huh. Like you have a triple helix. Like, he has a thing. Right. I have a cluster of Everyone goes back to the Greeks, right? Uh, every, yeah. We all need a <laughs> thing. Right? We need the Delta. Yeah. So we need a Delta, exactly. So, but Jeff's manual is, is deeper than just his textbook, which mm. is very good. But he, he has a way of teaching, which Jeff made his money in the, in the telco. Uh, when the telco came in, the wireless came in, and he did these, uh, he participated personally as a principal in these auctions of telco licenses, mm-hmm. and that was a real estate grab. And he, he did it with a guy who's very famous, I forget, and, and he, he made his, his yes. nest egg, and so he could be independent. So he goes to Babson, and but the, oh, in the posture, when you look at that, it, it's just like you and I do it all the time. We help founders, you know. I mean, so he helped the founder. Yeah, yeah right. But he put his own capital into it. Um, so Jeff, who's a wonderful soul, may he rest in peace, uh, goes and um, to Babson and creates sort of an institution around co-instruction. Hmm. He wants to energize entrepreneurship education in America or in the world by energizing adjuncts or lecturers and bringing them into the classroom and he does it through this instruction of co-instruction, and he builds an executive ed, ed course. Uh, at Stanford was Andy Grove. Uh, Andy, Andy Grove, Grove that? Uh-huh. He uh, came in and said, you, got, you realize you're in Silicon Valley, don't you think the business school at Stanford should take some account? And they said, okay, and they set up a co-instruction. They didn't call it that, but that's what it was. Okay, cool. And so, that's great. I didn't know Andy did that. Yes. Andy, to me, was... I had an interesting relationship. With Bergelman. Belgian oh, with guy. Bergelman? Yes. Well, that, that, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. I heard that from Bergelman. Yeah. As well as it's well known in the literature. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I didn't know that. So that's a good story. And uh, I wish I'd known, because that probably happened almost contemporaneously. Yes, it did. It was back in the 80s. Yeah, right. You know, mm-hmm. I was once in, a, in the Barnes & Noble Cafe in New York, working on my public venture capital book uh, with my co-author, uh, and this lady comes over. Uh, saying, you know, uh, what you're talking about sounds like what my husband is involved in. She was Mrs. Grove. <laughs> Gave us a car. Okay. <laughs> and you call so, Andy and say your wife. Because <laughs> to get through, I mean, I talked to Andy like three times in my life. I did. And he was honest, he was direct, and he was gruff. And he was like, you know. He, the wife was Viennese courtly style. Uh, no, Andy was great, but he, he said no to me. Like, yeah. like, but he, but, but well, he, sometimes it, it's better to have it. No, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But this was a, a one-hour conversation. Mm-hmm. In other words, it wasn't like no, go away. It was no, and let's discuss why. And yeah. you know, it was real. Yeah. It was really good. <laughs> anyway, mm-hmm. I just wanted to do stuff with Berkeley. He was, anyway, but the point is, okay, I want to build up Bab- a Babson <laughs> yes. story for a minute. Yes. Jeff Timmons. Yeah, mm-hmm. Jeff Timmons. I want to build him a story. T I M M O N S. Yeah, mm-hmm. right, that so, one is easy to. Yeah. So please. anyway, he created this course that probably still exists. Um, but when I wanted to build a faculty, at so I come to Berkeley. I don't know shit about anything, right? And they say do something. I, they don't give me a teaching role. So how did you get connected to Berkeley? Oh, well, remember Leo Halzol was teaching this course. The, I, we have lunch the donor, at the donor. We, the donor. Yes. we have lunch at the Lilac Cafe. Yes. Leo Helsel was the father-in-law of one of my partners, at, at one of my friends at, at, at AY, and uh, David Kirschman's father-in-law. And Leo and I are having lunch like this, and Leo says, bah, 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 and we're not talking about teaching anything. I'm just right. talking about, you know, I this firm, I build it, da, 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 da. Yeah. I don't know what I'm going to do, I'm, mm. I'm 40. You know, Leo, you're a successful entrepreneur. Yeah, he did. Leo did the, the Dymo label. And, yes. But it, Rabbi, you talk about rabbis. I mean, Leo was 40 years older than me, and he was, mm. I was like, "No, oh, tell me, Rabbi, what should I do?" Mm. And um, he was an old man already, and he said, "You should teach." Mm. And I said, "This is after a two-hour conversation." Yeah. And I go like, "Where does that come from?" I said, <laughs> "He said, Terry, you're a teacher." I, I go like, "What?" He says, "Come teach with me at Berkeley." 
And I go, like, so what? He wanted you to be his co-teacher. Yeah, he wanted me to sit in on the course and tea help. Yeah, he was looking. He's looking for a legacy to lay off his right, course. Right. Right. So you would pick it up. Yeah. After Maybe. some. Uh, yeah, yeah, some legacy yeah. process. I mean, it was an informal thing, and it was not like an offer of employment. It wasn't. Anything. It was just come. No, no, no. Yeah, come. Um, yeah, come. You know how that works. Yeah. Here's food. Somebody has eggs. That's my. Oh, I knew. You. See, somebody had to get eggs. Aren't those eggs something else? <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, there's so oh. much. Egg in the, oh, in the menu. Get there. this out of here. Whoa. I thought you were on the side. <laughs> yeah, it's on the side. That's good. It's good. good. I, I don't have. I, I need. This is good. That's right. Thank you. I'm going to put our hats down here. You won't forget yours. I won't forget mine. Definitely not. All right. Now I always forget my hat. There are more Berkeley hats around the world. <laughs> There's always cold day, right? <laughs> you can get plenty of them. Oh, yeah. uh, da, 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 da. I'm putting oh, yeah. this down don't here. But don't destroy that. I know that you no, no, hated no. it, but... No, no, no. I love it. I love it because people are building it. So many people... I mean, I have a project uh -huh. to create this. Uh -huh. I'm serious. To create this chart. And, uh, no, because I'm working with a friend to revitalize the entrepreneurship program at Berkeley and all this crap. You know, a donor who wants to raise $20 million. Okay, fine. So, now yeah, you've done it I'll, for I'll, me? No, I'll, I'll send it you'll to send you, but you'll, send you'll, you'll tell me, what are the boxes that are no, missing? No, no, I'm not going Look, to do any of that. Let me just tell oh, you. sorry, I know that's what you want. Let me just pitch you something. Yeah. Let's do a joint center between Berkeley and Stanford, and maybe even include some of the other places that need to be raised up, like San Jose State, San Francisco State. That's a very interesting idea, Henry. This is the Boston model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, you'll tell me more. Okay, so I'll show you. Yeah. Am I here at a history, again, at a history moment? Let me make sure that I record it. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> but go ahead. Okay, that's this, sorry, will, this is another thing we'll pick up on later. Yeah, okay, I know that my story. The thing I want to get to is a student thing. Yes. That's what's important. I'm sorry, I'm talking about myself. I'll do it for an hour. The, the, the thing is, I come to Berkeley with no... Uh, they don't have a vision. There's no top down. The point is, there's no top down. There's one outside. One outsider. Yeah. He's a donor, but nobody knows him. I mean, the dean knows him. If you go to the school now, you'll find a room. This guy's. A, he's. You know, there's a tradition in Judaism about giving anonymously. You know. He's, yeah. You know, the biggest. You give. Everybody should give, but to give anonymously is the is the best. Elevates the gift. Mm. And. You know, you can see that in academia. Every time you see, you know, like there's a Leo Helsel room or something, and, and he has his name on it. But everybody says, oh, yeah, yeah, ego gift. You look at that. But then you look, like Berkeley, I mean, and Stanford, all these names everywhere, right? But you look behind it, you, there are many more gifts that these people give where their names are not. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh display, you know? Right. So anyway, Leo was like that. So I, I, I show up with no franchise. I'm not even employed. I'm going to help teach this course. And I'm there like a day. And the dean, the co-instructor, Dick Colton, says, you know, maybe we should have a program or a center. Mm -hmm. And Leo says, I bet I can find a guy to help us. And he goes to Howard Lester, raises a million dollars. This is, Stanford would be a hundred million. Berkeley is a million dollars. And so Howard very generously puts up a million dollars. And I accept a 20% position, you know, one day a week. Right. But of course I should, I have, I quit so my job. And you're, I a, you're a reverse one-fifth rule. <laughs> yeah. Instead exactly. of coming out, no. you're coming in. Yeah, one bit. But I'm not teaching. I mean, I'm, I'm sure volunteering on this course, but I'm not an instructor of record. You don't understand these differences, right? And um, and I'm si and they give me an office, yeah. which is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they give me a phone, big deal, and they give me a business card. That's not a big deal. Yeah. Everyone has a car there, right? No, but a, but a room not, given out no, so easily. No, 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 no. I mean, if you know how to get one, yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but no. I mean, like, you're just an outsider. You think you have to be given one. It's a big deal to me. Because I quit my job. I said, I went back to the guys at AY and said, 
I'm gonna do this thing a day a week. And they were saying, they were moaning and groaning, yeah, 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 your national director or something. I said, you know what? I don't need that. Goodbye. <laughs> and so um, I think my salary is five thousand dollars a year, right? This is because like, it was it's twenty percent. It was twenty percent of forty thousand. Yeah. And uh, so, oh, I remember it didn't include parking. So the parking was five thousand dollars a year, and so anyway, it was fine because uh, also it was no, you know, I thought it was going to be a day a week or something. It, it was six days a week, and then I was also going to survive uh, on something else. But, but I'm all too much about myself. I'm sorry. I'm sitting in this office for 48 hours. Yeah. Wondering what do I do now, right? And of course, a student knocked on the door, and they said. Oh, this we, is student, graduate student, undergraduate? Graduate, MBA. Okay. I built my whole program around the MBA. Mm -hmm. Okay? The undergraduates are very, very, very important. Always got underserved. All right? But the MBAs were more mature, more proactive, more self-organizing. Uh, and they came to me and said, we hear you're in charge of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I, somebody told me that. <laughs> they said, good. You need a faculty advisor for our program. I said, mm -hmm. what's our program? I said, well, they said, well, last year we started a program mm -hmm. to help MBA students get jobs in startups. This is 1990. Because the end model is summer internships. Uh -huh. And they had already started this program called Partners in Entrepreneurial Leadership. Okay. And it had no academic linkage. Mm -hmm. And the students volunteered their time and went out and formed a club, mm -hmm. which is still that entrepreneur, yeah. that same club mm -hmm. that's on there. And these guys were so generous. What they would do is... is That's that Berkeley... Yeah, I, Entrepreneurs Association. Mm -hmm. um, it's a derivative. Mm -hmm. These guys were so generous. They worked like a group of eight people to find internships for like a group of 40. Mm -hmm. And they didn't take jobs themselves until everybody else had a job. Uh -huh. Oh, and that, so these were a group of eight. So yeah. What were they like? How did they come together? They were in their first year MBA. They were self-organized and say they would only. Do know if any of them are still around? And yeah, I can find them. Uh, they they just self-organized. The there was one guy the first year who I know, but who I'd have to look him up. I had nothing to do with him. He showed up later and sort of said, "Hey, I'm the guy." Um, but the two guys who were the current leaders showed up, Steve and the other guy. And um, anyway, they were doing this. And they said, can you help us? And so I gave them, you know, I gave them an umbrella. You know, I said, yes, you're, you're my program. And I'm your faculty director. Right. And, and, you know, it's, you know, whatever. And they were my thing. I had So no, in practice, what were you actually doing? They were already underway. So what did you... Nothing. I gave them blessing. Okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't get in their way, and I let them teach me what they were doing, and I introduced them. I introduced them to people, you know, yeah. I helped get jobs. I did what they did. I helped them succeed. Okay. Um, but so you gave them an added entree into the scene. Yeah, exactly. But then uh, that fed on itself. Okay, then the doors open, people say there is an entrepreneurship activity, there is a guy. Um, I took activities I was doing at, at, at Ernst & Young and brought them in. At Ernst & Young, I created already for 10 years a monthly entrepreneurs meeting yeah. where entrepreneurs would pay you know, 50 bucks or 100 bucks, I forget what it was, for lunch. Mm -hmm. And we'd come in for lunch, have a lunch and speaker once a month. Uh -huh. it was, I did that for business development. So I just brought that into an academic setting. And I moved it. Was it an academic setting? No. Except I moved, no free lunch. I moved it to dinner. Mm -hmm. I made it cocktails. And uh, on, and advertisers opened it to students right. and the business streets. That was all things. So it's basically, a, network, a networking opportunity. Networking. It's very common. Uh -huh. Who came from outside? Yeah, we, we, who came? Oh, a lot of entrepreneurs, entrepreneur yeah. wannabes. Uh, you know, people wanting to work with all entrepreneurs. Autodesk people. All, 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 yeah. all the people. You know, who always came. All my old clients. Yeah. You know. And so I had a lot of connectivity. That's what I brought to the university. I brought connection. <laughs> And that's why, like, if I went back to the day, well, whoever they would hire, like, they want to hire a new guy or whatever, I mean, they always hire the wrong people. They should hire people who have already established their credibility in the network. They always want to hire... Who do they want to hire? Academics? 
white young people who can do blah, blah, blah. Uh, That's wrong. They should hire uh, 50-year-old people who have done it and still have some juice left, yes, right? Yes, You know, who've got 10 years, you know, and that's yeah. it. 10 years now. Not They don't want 35-year-olds. 35-year-olds, 30, no, they got too much of a future to build. Anyway, right. you, you need people who've already done it. They so, who say, I'm giving back, right? And that's what I, my role was, give it back. So, yeah, yeah, so we, then, we built, then we built a program. And, the program, and then, then, when I had the Entrepreneurs Association, there were no, at the time at Berkeley, there were no monthly, now we have a, now if you go, there's a speaker, a Dean Speaker Series. Mm-hmm. Well, the Dean Speaker Series is a derivative of my Entrepreneurs uh-huh. thing for them. And so all this stuff, and then we had the Lifetime Achievement Award. And now the school has the Lifetime Achievement Award. Well, it was my Lifetime Achievement Award for entrepreneurship. And I gave it to people like, uh, you know, every, you know, the founders of Intel, you know, the big names, right? And I knew all these guys because I created at, at, at Ernst & Young, I had created something called the Lifetime uh, Entrepreneur of the Year Award, which is still a big deal. And uh, as a matter of fact, I tell people at the firm, they invite me every year to this thing in Monaco where they have the Entrepreneur of the Year Award because I'm one of three guys who founded the thing. And it's the, same. It's the one thing the firm still does in entrepreneurship is Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Blah, So all I did was bring into the university things I was doing on the outside and brought a lot of connections. So that's a key point. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, but the students really created the substance program. They would come in and say, we want to do this and we want to do that. Like... At the time, what was this and that? Uh, yeah, so example. At the time, business playing competition. There was no business competition at Berkeley. There was none at Stanford. There was, there was only four in the country. Okay, this is like, uh, the biggest one was the Moot Corp in Texas. Okay? What was Austin, it called? Austin, Texas. It was called Moot Corp. M-O-O-T. Corp. Corp. C-O-R-P. Because in law, there's something called Moot Court, yeah, that's right. which is where you practice being a lawyer. Mm-hmm. So, is there anything to do with IC squared? No, yes, I mean, I, yes and no. No, Gary was a Gary. What's his name? Was the founder Kismetsky. of Moot Corp. No. no, Gary. What's his name? Was the founder of what? And Moot Corp. IC squared was there and existed. Moot Corp was in the business school. IC squared is sort of an independent institute connected more with the engineering school. You know, it's the guy out of TI, uh, Texas Instruments. So, but when I went down there, the guy from IC Squared, the founder, that guy, hosted a uh, thing at his house, you know, in the hills, in the hill country, beautiful, yeah. blah, 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 yeah. we all had, you know, so it was us, they're friends. Yes. But yes. it wasn't their activity. Right. Right. Um, so anyway, so there were only four. So I went around and visited all four and, you know, took the students with me and we decided what was best practice. And then we created something at Berkeley that was 1999. Um, and now it's still there, and it's called something. It's called Launch. Um, but anyway, so, but at the time, business playing competitions were unique. Okay. So all this is coming from the students, is the, is the point. The Entrepreneurs Association, there ought to be, you know, the, the students were creating, okay, more examples, but real quickly. Every week, Students, MBA students, always like to found something. They don't want to. They either want to be the vice yeah. president of something, or they want to found something new. So every year, like the biotech guys want a biotech uh, entrepreneurs association. Uh, you know, some guys want a software as a service entrepreneurship. So what I tried to do was to organize, you know, give them some structure. So that's why there's one entrepreneurs association. But I took them all and I made them committees of. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. They can still launch it, but it's part of a, a yeah. bigger brand. Well, it's all in Haas, in business school. Yeah, I'm just... Well, Does it go outside okay, at all? Okay. Well, okay. A little complexity. Yeah. So when I first started, the, guy, the dean who set me up was a business school dean, but he said, this shouldn't be in the business school. It should be in the, the chancellor for research. Mm-hmm. So he put me in a university-wide chancellor for research, and I was doing things for a whole university. I was outreaching the engineering school, outreaching to liberal arts. I helped the liberal arts school, the College of Arts and Sciences set up an entrepreneurship program. Mm-hmm. I helped the engineering school set up an entrepreneurship program. Did these program. come together so students from different areas? Yeah, of course we wanted to. You but but? No, but it, 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 it drives the other way. The energy of it always drives. Everybody wants their own unique thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So here I was trying to hold it together. There was so much happening. And I was trying to keep it under an umbrella. 
And then I was a little, had a little success raising money. So when I had a little success raising money, the dean of the high school all of a sudden comes to me one day and says, yeah, but we'd really like to give you more office space. And I said, there's a new dean. And I said, fine, give me more office space. And yeah, we'd really like to, by this time I was teaching courses, you know, so I established this program of taking people. And they have the new building, by the way. Pardon me? They have the new building, they have more space. Yes, that's right. They're, they got the new building, they have more space. And uh, yeah, so coincident with the new building, I hope for fundraising for the new building, they gave me more space. But they said you ought to be in the business room. Rather, you know what I mean? Not just physically. I was always physically. Yes. But you ought to be part of. Right. Uh -huh. We want to honor you, right? Uh -huh. You don't have a home right now. The chancellor for research doesn't pay any attention to you. And in fact, I don't remember the chancellor for research once when I knocked on his door, asked for an appointment, and he said, hi, who are you? I said, well, I work for you. He said, very nice, what do you want me to know? And I met with him for a half hour, he said, very nice. <laughs> Good work. You know, and you know, so, yeah, it was fine. I was like, no, you know, so anyway, when they gave me a home, what I didn't realize is they also took took my didn't take it away from me, but they then had my endowment and I built an operating surplus. They took all of that. That was then what they do. Books. They didn't take it. They just owned it. It became part of their numbers, yeah. and I controlled it. And um, anyway, so. Then I got a fa oh, what, what they did was they gave me a faculty member. It was huge. John Freeman, a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh -huh. They hired, they recruited him back. He was, he was already full ladder faculty. They, were, they hired this guy back, uh, you know, in his 52 years old, 10 years ago. Full ladder faculty, etc. I'm going to start to eat my eggs. Yes. So, I'm thinking you're the only one who's not eating because you're, 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 no, of course, you're doing the talking. Yeah, but, yeah. but anyway, <laughs> so my eggs are already cooked. So, um, so together, he and I built a real robust program. We built a real adjunct faculty that was supervised, that co-taught with ladder faculty, that we went, all went through the Timmons training program. <laughs> we had like 12 to 15 adjunct faculty that re taught on a recurring basis. So uh, an array of courses relating to entrepreneurship? Yeah. Or what, what a kind of yeah. I mean, it was a center for entrepreneurship, and we had faculty research. We had I had people like you coming. I was publishing. Uh, we had some faculty on the ladder publishing. We had uh, we had everything going. Then I retired. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what is the continu continuation? Well, I, I, I hired a, I, I had an associate director who became the acting executive director. They opened the search. They hired a, a one of my students as the executive director. He ran it for three years. Uh, then they recruited a guy, I don't really want to say this, but they recruited a guy out of Harvard who essentially unraveled it all. Why? Because he said it's all second rate, it's not as good as Harvard, all these adjuncts, they're not ladder. Uh, yeah, he didn't, he didn't, well, academic ladder. Yeah. So he, he, you know, he, he's, it's not how he saw the world. He saw the world traditionally. And he, he, he managed it. He accomplished that. To take it apart. He took it apart and did he rebuild it in the way he wanted to or didn't he? He's not really. Hmm? Not really. No. So where did he where did he leave it? Where is it left now? It's all the elements uh -huh. have gone their own Different. direction. Uh -huh. The biggest element left is the I Corps program, mm -hmm. which Stanford participates in, but I help found with, co with Steve Blank as my co-founder, uh -huh. and I was a national faculty record for the National Science Foundation for five years for the i -Corps. And so when I retired from Berkeley, I put my energy against the National Science Foundation, and you know, and that's been disseminated across hundreds of universities and really drives entrepreneurship at a lot of universities. So what's Steve's role in this? Steve? Yeah. He's the creator. Okay. And he's a spokesperson, and he's a, the soul, he's the soul of it. Okay. Now he also operates at Stanford. Very much so. He teaches it. Exactly. Yeah, so does that. that bring any connection, or it's two separate things? Two separate things. Okay. But I, but I go to Stanford and help him teach that every once in a while. And okay. So okay. as individuals, we do things. Right. But usually these connections tend to be individuals anyway. Okay. It, it, it shouldn't be that way. But well, uh, here, in the Bay Area, yes. Yeah. In Boston, no. 
<laughs> Tell me about it. Now do your turn. That's all yeah. it is. Oh, okay. We're, we're finished here. <laughs> I've told you everything. In Boston, works. it's like uh, I call it the University of Boston. Because all the schools are in this uh, closer, well, he would call it an ecosystem. Well, first of all, they're physically closer together. You know, over time, they almost come up against each other. Uh -huh. You can go, one thing starts, the next school starts. It's so tight, geographic. But more than that, there's a tradition there that if, say, Harvard starts the Russian Research Center, it draws on faculty from all over. And not just as an adjunct member, but for years, the head of the Russian Research Center was a professor from Wellesley. Mm -hmm. But he was head of the Russian Research Center at Harvard. In history of science, Boston University takes the lead, but the members are from all over. In gender, it's Brandeis taking the lead, but there are 200 members of the Gender Center at Brandeis from the whole greater Boston academic area. So, and, uh, you know, and it there was like a cluster. Yes, yes. And so you know, there was uh, the joint MIT Harvard Center of Urban that uh, Moynihan was head of. So sometimes even explicit. But usually it's implicit, and each school takes the lead in some area, and the others participate. That's the Boston model. It's unusual. Uh, because on the one hand, these places are highly competitive. On the other hand, each has more of their own niche. Harvard is Harvard, MIT is MIT. Okay? Whereas in the Bay Area, there was more of a direct competition between Berkeley and Stanford. With uh, the decades, Stanford being the junior one coming up, trying to surpass Berkeley as a research school, and so on. Anyway, more of a competitive dynamic. The only cooperation was for in the 80s there was a bus that went between the two schools so you could use the libraries at different places. And the idea was it should be more than that. We would do more collaborations, but nothing more ever happened. I'll give you another example. There's a, something at, at Stanford, uh, a ScanCor, Scandinavian Consortium for Organizational Research. Jim March uh, started it decades ago. It still goes on. It brings Scandinavian scholars. Now it's a little broader. Recent, a couple of years ago, uh, an analogous operation was started at Harvard. Okay, ScanCore Harvard. But I was, but the direct person at Stanford who announced it said, oh, but at Harvard it's going to be different. It's going to be people from the whole Boston area participating. Okay. The, the University of Boston ethos took over. And so when this same thing was started there, they restructured it so it would fit the Boston model. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, I gently asked him, well, how come we don't do that here at Stanford? And he just, you know, he didn't know. Uh, he didn't understand why, but that's just not the ethos here. It seems to me that here there's a lot of uh, a lot of collaboration at a person-to-person -person level, not yeah, institutional. Not, yes, a, well, there in Boston, and there's a lot of trust also. I mean, people yeah, trust it, uh, other people, yeah, but, but it's, there's not even uh, too many informally organized things. Like here's the perfect example: Steve Blank works in one operation at Stanford, another at Berkeley, but it didn't lead to any joint informal thing the way in Boston, that's the not natural tendency, uh -huh. that's the social inbuilt tendency in the Boston area now to operate collaboratively. Whereas here it's not. So if we actually try to do this model, it would have to overcome a lot of inertia. But it's not impossible. These things are always uh, changing. I, I see now why you're, I see now your energy. Hmm? Now I understand your proposal. Yes. Yes. Yes, because it's not native to this region. Part of the part of the world. <laughs> exactly. I'm interested. But also ultimately, that's why the Boston area could retake leadership. No. Not this no. Okay, I don't no. want to get into that hypothesis. No, 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 let me just add this one sentence on that. Okay. I think that's the wrong lens what I want to say. Okay. I think that's an important thing. This idea about leadership, that's a competitive frame. Yes. I, I think that's the wrong frame. Okay. 
That's all. Okay. I'm, I'm done. Okay. I mean, I just mean on that. I just mean. Just okay. A, a anyway, look, um, Dick Scott. Yeah. Just did a very interesting book on universities in Silicon Valley. And he identified what I've been saying for a long time, but he documented it. There's a gap, a university gap. There's only two and a half research u universities mm -hmm. in this region. Mm -hmm. Berkeley, Stanford, and UCSF in the biological sciences. Should be at least half dozen. Not only population, but in terms of the needs of industry and the whole society. But the California Master Plan kept down San Jose State and San Francisco State from growing up the way they would have without that. It was a good idea 60 years back to have this division of labor, but it's blocked those schools from rising the way they should. They made an exception in San Diego because they knew they needed something else than just uh, UCSD, so San Diego State was allowed to rise to PhD programs. Mm -hmm. But to this day, San Francisco State and San Jose State can't do that. Whereas in Boston, they've been moving up that way. And in other places. Okay, so uh, that's a so gap. So this other universities, they are not allowed to have uh, uh, graduate programs that no, don't pass the they're not masters. allowed, they're not allowed. Uh, they're, they're, they're essentially polytechs. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? They're, yeah. they're about practice. Uh -huh. At the master's level. Right. Uh -huh. They're limited to the master's They're level. teaching but, but, universities. But, you, well, yes and no. But they have researchers there. Yeah. But who are operating individually through connections to Stanford or Berkeley. Yeah. Uh, and occasionally, like when I did study of the... Uh, they're only empowering the others. They're never being no, able they, to collect... No, they're not allowed, to, not allowed to buy this plan. But they're... Like the, the Center for Astrophysics, uh, part of Astrophysics at Berkeley, has people from... Uh, San Francisco State there because part of the uh, mandate was that they include people from other schools mm -hmm. for that uh, engineering and research center program. Okay, but they're second class members. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's the only way it, it happens. So anyway, uh, this region has some serious gaps which it's not addressing, not only in housing and transportation but also in academia. That's the big picture. So what, so, for, let's solve your problem yeah. now. Well, how can we help you, no, Alex? Okay, <laughs> we are now trying to do an analysis of the, quote, Berkeley Innovation System, to really put some meat on this skeleton here. Of uh, So, whatever you could tell us about these different entities uh, would be helpful. Yeah, in fact, you have already told us a little bit bring that, that it's as that chaotic as, as we let's thought it was. Them. One thing that you 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 you, you said, and I I really had already noticed. I'm oh, sorry, this this side is better. Right? <laughs> uh, there is a lot of these boxes that are students, uh, let's say, uh, uh, that are student student run. Uh, definitely, which is something curious. Okay. So he was not. It's interesting. This. Does it's, this it's, work for you, or would no. you draw it differently? I thank you. There's a, I don't I don't want to recreate the wheel, but I can just say there's an embedded bias in this that puts the OTLs on the top mm. and the academic programs on oh. the bottom. And I how think, would you draw it? Well, it's certainly the way around. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And <laughs> you know that it was this guy here who, who drew. I, I understand it was Cohen, right? But you know, I always Cohen thought that the, the map of the world should have the south in the north and the north in the south, and <laughs> it never happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm just saying. Okay, but this is also interesting. Let's talk about Cohen for a minute. I don't know him well. Why do I not know him better? Because I should know him very well. Because he's young, and not so young now, but he's always been younger than me. He's had the best interests at heart. He, I, I, I like what he thinks. Uh, he has energy. So who is he? Tell me a little more. He's, he's a, well, this is what, this guy that we've been. I know, talking. I know, but who is? From well, what I know of him, he's uh, he's at the he's at the university level. In other words, he's not in any of the colleges. He's associated with the Office of Technology Licensing, and he's also been very interested in building Berkeley, the city, as an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So where is he located? In the university, he's I don't even know his office. Well, he's in the office of technology licensing. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's okay. his Ipira. He's, he's the Ipira guy. The, the one that we were going to remember. Okay, I know we're going to see this yeah. guy. I don't know anything yeah. more yeah. than that. So he's out of the OTL. Yeah. And okay. he's, always good. he's always had to write the, And he would come to me and push me, right? What did he do? What did he push you to do? Well, he wanted, he wanted to do... When he was pushing me, he essentially wanted to create Skydeck. Mm -hmm. Skydeck okay. is yeah. a incubator in the city that um, is not... That bridges... It says he does economic development for the city of Berkeley in a way, because it's outside the campus, and it uh, it utilizes underutilized office space at the time that it was. And who's underutilized office space? Well, it's a big old 18-story office building. Who's that's a private? It was T owns it now. Okay. Professor T. Yes. yes. He owns a half of it, mm. but um, and it was a private property. They, they donated the space? Or how do, rent it. They rent it. Rent it. Who pays the rent? Um, City of Berkeley? You no, know, I do. So it's you do? What do you mean you? I mean, I'm a donor. Yeah, I'm a okay. Donor. It's a foundation, sponsor. right? Yeah. It's an it's a, it's a incubator. Got it. I mean, I pay one one thousandth. I mean, but you know, I mean... It's, Other donors pay. Yeah, right. And then they charge money. It's a business. Yes. Um... They charge money to, uh, you know, so teams. Who started this? He did? Who? Well, yeah, I would say he's a founder. He probably is a founder. Um, I, I'm probably a founder. So I don't even know. Where did it percolate from? From Tease. I would say really from Tease. David Tease. David Tease. Oh, really? The Haas. Yeah. How, how did that happen? Well, Tease have bought the building. Tease, it's an 18 story building. Tease owns some big piece of it. At, He's Dave, the professor there, right? Yeah. David Tease, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at Haas. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and he's also wealthy. Mm -hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. Very. Oh. From his company? No, just I don't, many years. Okay. You go to New Zealand, he owns a third. Really? Yeah. Oh. Oh. I go to New Zealand. I, I fly into an airport. He, lay, he picks me up in a helicopter, and we fly over his, <laughs> his vineyards and his forests. And oh. His, so it's not just his consultant firm here yeah, that... I don't know. I don't ask David where the money comes from. Okay. Yeah, I, okay. So, very, very established. Okay. Um, so, uh, anyway, I mean, but he doesn't do it. David sponsored me. David was my rabbi. In other words, I mean, he he was my academic rabbi. I mean, I had Freeman, but also when I came to the, when, 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 uh, when Holton brought me to the university and, and said, you need a home, he went to Tease and said, take care of him. And what was that like? What did he do to take care of him? Tease gave me a, he gave me an umbrella. Like I gave the students an umbrella. He gave me a umbrella. What was the umbrella he gave you? He had a center called the Institute for Management and Innovation. Okay. And he said, here, I'm, he gave me a, at one point an office in his center. And, Okay. You know, and what was his role from then on? I guess I worked for him, but he, okay. never, he, he never had any involvement. But uh, he was wonderful. You okay? But you interacted along the way. You developed things together, or you were just on your own with his blessing. More or less, on my Which, own with his blessing. Okay, okay. But if I needed help, so tell us more about his role in this. Jeez. Look, turn that off. <laughs> I got David is hugely successful. Hi for now. Let's stick to the point. We're back to the party. Yeah. So. So okay. I think like here. Just take this. This is what I know the most about. Okay. What is this? It, this is the Berkeley Haas yeah. Entrepreneurship Program. This yes. is what I found. Yes. Yeah. That's the Lester Center. Yes. This is Lester Center. Yes. It had many elements, right? And there's a lot of fabric. Like launch is a program of the center, mm -hmm. right? You know, there's a, there's a, there's a, so there ought to be color coding mm -hmm. or something to show right. yes. how these things align, uh -huh. right? Color coding. Yeah. That's that's a good good idea, but 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 it's good to know the history of uh, of that for them. So like Skydeck is a partnership between the, the business school through the entrepreneurship program, 
the engineering school. I don't know if through Sudarja or Fung or wherever. Yeah, Sudarja, wherever. Sudarja, it's the engineering okay. school. Yeah, yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure they are involved with uh, Skydeck. Involved yeah. is not... Involved in the sense that, okay, they put it, they put the thing. They, they claim that it's, they, okay. they did it uh, on their own. You know? Okay, <laughs> let me tell you what yeah. involved me. Yeah. There's a board of directors that has three people on it. It has the, 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 the vice chancellor for research, has the dean of engineering, and it has the dean of the business school. Okay. That is a, is a board Sky Deck. Uh, of Skydeck. Uh -huh. okay. okay. But it's not Skydeck Fund, it's no, Skydeck Sky Accelerator. Yeah. Okay, right. so where does uh, OTL fit in? Since this guy apparently is involved in it. Or no? <clears throat> they, they, OTL as an entity, to my knowledge, has no connection to any of this. Mm. Okay. Mm. I mean, it's an OTL. Yes. Okay. It's a gatekeeper. But, yes. But this guy within OTL seems to be playing a broader role yes. than a traditional OTL. He's a, he, he loves... <laughs> I mean, he, he wants to foster commercialization. I mean, he's operating at the right level. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> right? He wants to foster the objective. Yes. He wants to be remembered because everything will have to go through there anyway to get out of the university. I don't know. No? I don't know if he's even thinking like that. He just wants to foster commercialization. Yeah. He sees the broader role of OTL <laughs> as it's in many universities it grows out to be an innovation vice president right. segment of the university. And and and, and Berkeley is not right yes. because research is independent and we don't have a commercialization perspective. We don't have a. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, all <clears throat> these things, like the House Fund and Osage Partners, they're all independent. But funding support, I mean, these are a small, like at Stanford, you would have comparable things. But this is a very small subset. Mm -hmm. These are all, I think I'm a founder of the Berkeley Agent Network. I mean, and I'm a It's alumni, right? It's, Pardon me? It's alumni, basically. It's nothing. It's, no. a, it's exactly what it says. It's a, yes, it's alumni. But by exactly what it says, what do you mean? It's a network. Okay. That means it's nothing. And what does it do? It has, it has, it has a deal flow. It has a vetting. It has funding meetings. We invest in companies. Okay, is but, it significant in no. the scene? Why not? Scale, how many deals of funds? How many deals of funds? Uh, a dozen a year. Okay, out of what should be... I don't know, should be, what we could don't know, be... The I mean, there's thousands. I mean, the, the reason it's insignificant <clears throat> is because it's basically... I mean, it's important, it should be yeah. here. Yeah. Yes. But it's, it's basically a club, in other words, entertainment uh -huh. for the people who participate, yes, right. it's not really driven towards the success of the Berkeley ecosystem. Uh -huh, it, right. it contributes to it. Yeah. But what it, the people, the reason it exists is because the people who invest want to have, it's like getting the income. Yeah, yeah. They want to have dinner some, together. Yeah, exactly. Camaraderie. Okay, so. Uh, well, I guess that's are there the, other, the Sigma Eta P. Now, are, there, <laughs> are there other entities that aren't listed that are doing similar things that didn't make it onto this table? Well, no, they should be there. But so, so. No, but are there others that aren't here, but that are doing that? Or is this the whole universe of funders? Of well, funding clubs? Well, i -Corp provides i -Corp provides $50,000. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody who participates in i -Corp at the national level gets $50,000. Yeah. Yes. So in a way, that's, that's funding. Fund and there's a lot of funding, like in, 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 in some of the, yeah. even uh, uh, these things here, because they give space okay. for free. So there's they, some of these. Yeah, and this is $100,000 cash. Okay. I mean, that's so some of these are doing hybrid functions. They all are. They all are? They all, they all are, I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah this, is some, this is something that I had difficulty with this, because it seems that boxes are here, but the same box is here and is at other places. Okay, so this one is doing more than funding. Yeah, like for instance, let me just tell you the problem. You want to fill in a matrix. It's almost hopeless. It's, it, this is indicative. It's like an iceberg. Like legal support. <clears throat> this Berkeley High's on version program has office hours. What's office hours? It's they bring in lawyers for yeah. free every week or yeah. something. 
Well, that's legal support. I mean, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. you know, to call it an academic program is like nothing. It, it doesn't speak to what it does. Right? Mm -hmm. That's why the color code. Uh -huh. So the sheet would have to be larger. Yeah. You'd say office hours, and it would say Lester yeah, Center. You'd have a color code, mm -hmm. connect, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so if what you want to do is sit here and have me fill in this, I think that's a waste of our time. Okay. Okay. I mean, I, so I mean, what's, the discuss, best, what, what's the best use of our time? This guy, just talk about this project you want to do. Ah. Oh, so so okay. I'll turn this off. <laughs> turn no, this off. No, 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 keep it on, you can keep okay. it on, keep it on. Well, look, what I, I see two gaps. One, I see a gap at Stanford, and there's no broad scope consideration of innovation and entrepreneurship. There's the various things like Steve's doing lean startups, it's very, Stanford's very good on the specifics, whether it be in the engineering school or the business school now, uh, or the students having done the Stardex. Mm -hmm. But the liberal arts part of the university, uh, STS should be involved in this, but it's too purely academic and it doesn't have its own entity. It's just a, a nameplate where you're for le really doing courses and having undergraduate major for the athletes, basically, is the function it uh, serves. So, uh, so, I'm sort of there, but I'm an outlier. Uh, there's a couple of faculty who have a little bit of interest in it, but there's no one centrally interested in the broad issues of innovation, entrepreneurship, regional development, and so on. Okay? That uh, classically has been Berkeley's area. Okay? Uh, at the, there's the whole department uh, in the area of, uh, I forget what it's called. It's now on the downtrend. Its faculty aren't being replaced. Um, but uh, Peter Hall used to be there. He's the, uh, the was the leading British guy in this field uh, in the UK, uh, and he was on the faculty at Berkeley. What field? Uh, it's more or less sort of regional development, regional studies. I forget what it's called, but it, it doesn't even fit in here because it's probably it's winding down and was looking at the uh, academic side of this whole field, but. If it was going on the uptrend, we'd be looking at these kinds of issues that we're talking about. This is more micro level, and then you're talking no. about a macro level. No, 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 no. What we are is right where Henry Eskovitz uh -huh. sits. Right? This is your opportunity and your problem. Yeah. To let, me, let me talk about go you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Because I'm going to, I want you to, I'm going to put out a hypothesis. Please. And I want you to correct it. Go ahead. My hypothesis is that you come at this whole area from a regional economic development perspective. And I come at it from a different perspective. First of all, I don't know if that first statement is true, but I'll put it out there and then I'll say and I'll say my second and then And you might say, so what do you mean by that or what's that got to say? Yes, please. Water please. Um, please be my guest, you travel. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, I come at it from way back from helping an individual entrepreneur succeed perspective. Right? <laughs> And by, by what I mean by regional economic development, I mean you can't come at it from a system perspective. Sort of like what's going on in a region. And at a level, I don't care. <clears throat> I come at it from how do I help this entrepreneur succeed? Yeah. Yeah. Different. Why does that matter? Because in the end, my reputation today might be as much built around a, one book I wrote, only one, on clusters of innovation. Mm -hmm. What does that sound like? It sounds like yeah, great sounds like him. Yeah. economic <laughs> development. Yeah. More than my books. Yeah. Yeah. So, and why, and why do I write a book? And I only, I edited it, but I wrote, you know, the, I wrote the book. In other words, I laid out the framework and I, and I wrote yeah. four chapters of it. And, I got the others all to write original work, and I forced them to write it on my structure. Right. It wasn't an edited volume of other people's like right. uh, <laughs> the old material. Yeah. And 
Why did I care? It took me five years to do that. I cared, I'm not sure why, because I think back, did it foster my mission? You know, whatever my personal mission is, it helped, but it missed what I say is my most important thing, which is helping entrepreneurs succeed. That book does not help entrepreneurs succeed. There's nothing for it. it not it directly. Not, not directly. Not directly, but no, no, yeah. not directly. agencies can... Yeah, 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 yeah. But not directly, yeah. right? And I'm yeah. going at what's the center. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. I'm going for the P yeah. underneath yeah. the mattress, right? Yeah. That's why I'm calling you yeah. regional. Okay. So, that's essentially the end. So, my question for myself. So, I, I'm glad I wrote the book. It, gave, it gives me a podium. We have this discussion, but you and I don't compete academically. No, yeah, no, we don't. We're very complementary. Mm -hmm. You're much more on the practical side, and I'm much more on the theoretical. But I also have been involved with entrepreneurs. Yes, you have. Mentor, uh, I, I've never had a successful uh, one, but because I've probably been involved with female. Entrepreneurs, and, and, I, and I, I, yeah, I respect that, of okay. course. So, and, 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 and I don't want to deny you that. I yeah. really don't. Want, I want yeah. to respect that. But that's that. not primarily what and, I do. And, and I've also been involved in regional economic development. I know. So, and it's not primarily what I do. And when I talk to mayors or city councils about building their ecosystem, I somewhat feel like a fish out of a phony. Yeah. Because I'm like, you know, because so so what I wrote about, let me, yeah. what I wrote about. I didn't study. Okay, what I mean is, no. I, it was all inductive. Mm -hmm. It was all my hypothesis. Everything I wrote as fact mm -hmm. is simply hypothesis. Sure. Based on my mm -hmm. apocryphal or uh, existential experience. Absolutely. Where you, I hope, study an area. Well, I do both. Yeah. Look, I am eclectic. I uh, am involved in practice. And I learn from that. I also go into the archives and work historically. I also do uh, interviews, and I sponsor and work with other people to do interviews and collect data and write. That's yeah. through a network of international collaborators. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's my yeah. special thing. Is the yeah. international. You and you have a big network. Yes. And you are respected. The triple helix. Uh, I respect tremendously. The Triple Helix Institute, or whatever you call, you know, and uh, and this conferences you have, and I look at that and say, "Wow, should I have done something like that?" And I go, "Like, no, that's not me." But I respect that you did it, and I think it's wonderful. Yes. Okay. But I also operate on the on the ground. Of course. Okay. Uh, and I see the gaps here, uh, and just I saw the gap when I in know four or five at Stanford, and now it's been filled to a great extent. So now still, we come to the action. There still are gaps. Yeah, yeah, there are. In the region. Yes, in now, the region. They're always, but now we come to the action. Because that's what we're discussing, what to do next. And you look at it and you see the gaps. Right, I say they're there. This is like Cohen coming to me. This is just like, you're just like Mark, Mark Cohen, right? Yeah. Just like Mark Mike, Cohen, Mike, 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 Mike Cohen, Cohen, coming to me 20 years ago. I mean, he's been around for a while. Okay. Having this third, third gap. He wasn't talking about gaps. He was saying there's some <laughs> obvious needs, right? And I would go, yes. And I'm going to give you the same reaction, which is not to say no, but it's to say like, but where's the champion? In other words, where's the direct... Where is the direct linkage? See, when I say I'm entrepreneur-centric, what that means is I'm directly linked to as much understanding the gap. This is about product market fit. It's about I understand the gap, but where's the, the, the person or small group that when they work to fulfill the gap, gets the direct affirmation, feedback, profitability, the whatever elements, reward? The elements of the small group are as follows. Yourself, Myself, Walney, maybe Mark Ranavetter. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mark. Okay, uh, he's a sociologist. He's the founder of economic sociology. Okay. He's a very traditional yeah. 
I love academic. That. I love that. You can actually need to read it because essentially what I wrote was economic sociology. Yeah, okay, yeah. He, he's uh, the economy and society. Yeah, yeah, Harvard yeah. University Press. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, but he's a very traditional conservative academic. But he's interested in triple helix. He studied venture capital. Okay? Yeah. Uh, his article on venture capital, some article I did, I said the two best articles on Silicon Valley, whatever that's worth. Okay? So he's, he's interested in this idea, but uh, he's not going to take action, but he would right. join in. Right. If, okay, and basically, the word I have is that Stanford, if there's $25 million, that's the entry fee. Yeah. Okay. So that's like, fuck you. I mean, that, that, I mean, that's how I take that. Sure, that's the same thing. Mer Merkley's five million. But it was, yeah, no, yeah. Like, no, but that's like... I, no, but that's not exactly fuck you because there are people around with those sums. For example, the Silicon Valley Archive. Yeah. When I came here in the 80s, we met with this guy in the library who had just formed this archive to collect uh, all the interviews yeah. and materials. Uh, Henry Lowell. Yeah. A couple of years ago, uh, through a series of connections, he was put in touch with, I forget the guy's name, but who laid 25 million on the Silicon Valley Archive, which is now going to renovate part of the library, which they shouldn't do. They shouldn't destroy the library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but... Uh, it's, They're building buildings. They they, yes, okay, so he's, I'm trying to move that away. But anyway, uh, it's, not an out of, it's not an outrageous sum at all in this neighborhood. So I don't see that as a fuck you. I say that's a entry card to catch interest. Yeah. And there are people around, if they catch the idea, who do that. All he, what did this guy want? He had an idea. He wanted to inspire young people to be entrepreneurs. Yeah. And so he commissioned an artist to do, paint pictures of uh, the entrepreneur leaders, and he wanted to display them in this new commons, dining commons at Stanford. So anyway, yeah. so we put in touch with Henry, and Henry showed him a bigger picture. And so the result is 25 million to fund the uh, Silicon Valley Archives, which now have endowed professorships. That's a big, uh, librarians don't have endowed professorships, but this guy and his, uh, his other historian there, Leslie Berlin, who wrote the book on, uh, what's his name from, uh, Noyce. We're going to put on noise. Yeah. She's going to have an endowed professorship now. Okay? Uh, and, wow. and the archives, well, they want to collect my materials. And they'll have the resources to take all the old tapes and put on MP3. No problem at all to do all that. So they're going to have these resources. So from that guy who just wanted to have his paintings, he's, he's shown a bigger picture. He was uh, an attorney uh, who made money there and then went into real estate development where he made the real money, and then decided he wanted to give back. And so uh, he had his little idea of how to do it, and was shown a bigger picture, but still a very limited big picture. Okay? So, I wrote a piece which I'll have to send you. Please do. In the Stanford Daily. Okay? In which I said, don't tear out. Oh, there's a student, actually, who wrote this thing. I responded to the student, who said, he said, this is a beautiful library space. We students in the humanities love this space. Don't, don't tear it up, okay? Uh, so uh, I, I wrote saying I've been a supporter of the Silicon Valley Archives in the mid-80s, which is true. Uh, and, uh, but it shouldn't do this. It should uh, come together with the Martin Luther King Center, which is located in a temporary building, an old closet hut that they they put out uh, Edit King papers from here, okay? Uh, and that's off to the side, the whole social justice wing of the university. So let's put the archives together uh, with the social justice wing and a center on innovation and entrepreneurship. Let's put them as three wings of an entity. And, okay, so I published this. I published this. Uh, you know, no real over reaction, but uh, from the conversations with Martin, I know that if you bring, we bring in some funds to match the sort of 25 million there, uh, this could happen. It's not uh, out of the reach. It already is partly there. There's a space there, the Galvez modular, off to the side of the yeah. library. Yeah. That's where it should be. The innovation and entrepreneurship, big, big thing. Uh, thing. Uh, for the region and beyond.
all the wannabe Silicon Valley's always come here wanting some kind of guidance, and we all give it to them. Yeah. But it could be done in a much better and more organized way. Uh, so this is what uh, Walney, he's a he's a potential funder, yeah. okay, yeah. and he knows that. Uh, he doesn't want to do it by himself. So we've got to bring together the right group of partners. But I think those are some of the elements. The social justice, the Martin Luther King Center. I love the idea. The archive and Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. I love the idea. Okay. And we bring in, and then we, we bring in all the other universities somehow into this. I love so, the idea. Okay. So there's be someone's name on it, on a new building. That's what Stanford is good at. Yeah. They're good at building buildings. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, they're, they're, they're not bad at filling the buildings either. That's also been a good thing, especially in an interdisciplinary way. And so this would be a natural to include the social entrepreneurship as the link between the King yeah. Center, because that's what he was talking about. Yeah, yeah. This King Center at Stanford is purely academic with an historian, but I'm sure they're open to these other things. I know. I happen to know Clarence, King's per attorney, lives in the same apartment complex at Oak Creek that I do. Okay? I, my first book is dedicated to Martin Luther King. My dissertation was on the Bedford Stuyvesant Community Cooperative Center, which is in a so, in social entrepreneurship in the mid 60s before the term was invented. We invented that back then, yeah. myself and a person with actual business experience. It was a bit crazy, Jerry Schaffner, out of uh, the Mad Men era of Madison Avenue. Yeah. Okay, and so we, we entrepreneured this center uh, to start businesses which would turn over the profit to social services. Mm -hmm. Large infant care center when it was not yet legal. Mm -hmm. A gas station and drugstore. We couldn't get, we tried to get membership in the cooperative movie to start a supermarket. That was the bigger vision. Anyway, book called Ghetto Crisis, dedicated to King. Published in 1969, Little Brown. Okay, so that's my background, a piece yeah. of my background. Got it, thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and I later got interested, in, well, actually, through a company that Jerry was founding to develop photovoltaics technology in response to the energy crisis in the mid 70s. He invited me to come out, but then I had my PhD, so he, take a look at what's going on. And I interviewed the scientists in the firm, physicists with make money from stock options and semiconductor industry. And I interviewed them, and I told them, we don't write articles, we go for patents. And then, so they didn't fit the model of the, the virtual model of the academic science. But then they didn't fit the model of the industrial scientists either. They weren't part of some large bureaucracy. In fact, it seems that they were the ones who were funding this firm. They had a say in its course and development. So I began to, I defined them as entrepreneurial scientists and invented that concept. And then the consultants of the firm from the UCLA chemistry department, they didn't seem any less entrepreneurial. They were going out and getting consulting work from companies, looking for funds from different government agencies. So they seemed to be entrepreneurial as well. So then I began looking at this entrepreneurial phenomenon in universities and got first funds from NSF back in the early uh, 80s to do this through contracts uh, that uh, promos give out. Five thousand uh, dollars. Now it's ten. I'm just on there. Say so. To an interesting looking idea. So we developed a, a nationwide. Pro that's how I first came to Stanford, uh, doing interviews on the first grant that followed from that early project. And so that's how I got into this as a whole academic area. Wrote an article on entrepreneurial scientists and entrepreneurial universities in American academic science, 1983 in Minerva. First site doesn't come for 10 years, because it's so ahead of its time. At that time, I didn't know that I was inventing a new concept. I thought there was such a thing as entrepreneurial university, but it seems that's the first time it was set forth. I found it later, okay? So that's how I got into this whole area. I got my start in it. But, uh, and then I, along the way, also got involved when there was the, um, Shortfall, the guy who became head of NSF, the industrial scientist, became head of NSF, he thought there was a shortage of PhDs. Okay, and so he called up NSF, 
uh, the, uh, the uh, head of the uh, sociology program. Uh, I was head of the science, knowledge, and technology section by that time of the American Sociological Association. So she called me and said, what do you guys know about women in science? And I gave her the usual names, and I also told her about a student of mine, Carol Kemmergaard, who was doing a senior project with me, because I had an hypothesis that academic research groups are small businesses in all, but they don't have the profit mode. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, their organizational mode is a small business. Mm -hmm. So I call them quasi-firms. Okay, and Carol was doing interviews in the genetics department at Columbia University Medical School. One day she came back to me and said, the women back there are organizing their research groups differently than the men. More collegially, less hierarchical. It's interesting, but it's not our topic, so I filed it. But when uh, I was called up by NSF, I told them about this and said, you're in the field, you should get a grant. Go ahead and do the study, and we'll see if the grant comes through. So I think it's the first time they were handed, they were handed the uh, report at the same time they announced that we had study. So that got me into this whole field of gender and a nationwide study that followed on from that. And the book, uh, Athena Unbound, The Advancement of Women in Science and Technology. And I've been working on that area ever since and include, and that includes me mentoring and sponsoring uh, female-led uh, firms along the way. So, And that couldn't be more topical even still. Absolutely. I have new, book, new directions in gender science and technology. I finished chapter 19 Sunday night <laughs> with colleagues from this European Union project that was completed a couple of years ago. Fantastic. Okay, so that's a little more background. No, I got it. No, it's very, very helpful. And so we've overlapped in a lot of places. We don't need to go through them all, but it's mostly on values. Yes. It's right here in the overlap. Yeah. So, so I think the following should be to bring together another meeting with uh, ourselves and Walney, maybe David. I think it's too early for Mark. He's too traditional until it's more real. I would invite, I would let him know and invite him, but I don't think he would do it, but you never know with him. He shows up with things I do at Stanford. You know, for the, the dentist, because he wants to meet a potential PhD students mm -hmm. who are always involved in these things. That's his, you know, main interest. He runs the economic sociology workshop. It's Monday evenings. To get okay. David involved, I'd have to have a pre-meeting with him. To, of course. Uh, you know, see where he's at. Yes. Um, have the pre-meeting. If you'd like to have me join, I mean... No, we, we've never pre-meeting would have to be just me and him. Please, do that. Do yeah. that. I mean, do the pre-meeting. Yeah, no, it's just a matter of making it happen. It's not. It's not a matter of permission. It's just a matter of time yes. and and. No, and we're all on a relaxed, yeah. relatively relaxed time frame here. Nobody's relaxed. No. So you. <laughs> yeah. The only make it happen. I'll tell you what. The, I have a a challenge with your idea. Yes. What is it? The building. Look, I don't care about the building. Does, for me, it should be a virtual institute. Yeah. For me, okay. For, for me as well. That's. I mean. So for, I, I don't. The building uh, isn't. No, I'm just saying. Let me give you feedback. Yeah. Don't, you don't have to deflect it. I want to give you a reaction. Sure. I think once you institute the idea of a structure <clears throat> and an entity that resides in a structure on the Stanford campus, I think that intrinsically. That works against your purpose. I agree completely, and I'll tell you my other experience on this line. In New York, I took, you know, that's where I was based for decades. How could I guess? Okay. Uh, I, and I went to St. Louis to wash you in order to have a chance to get back to New York, because someone advised me, you want a job in New York, you come from outside. And I got a job at this new school, the State University of New York campus at Purchase. Yep, no well. Oh, okay. I'll ask you about that another time. I don't know well. I know it. Okay, okay. Anyway, anyway. So I mean, I'm from Philly. I, I mean, I, right. I, I, okay. <laughs> anyway, there aren't enough innovation researchers in New York at any one school. Right. So I called together uh, Dick Nelson from Columbia yeah. and then Dorothy Nelkin from NYU, mm -hmm. and we met at the Opera Cafe mm -hmm. at Lincoln Center. I know it. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. The idea, something like what we're talking about now, to form a joint center yeah. for New York. And basically, uh, so 
They all liked the idea. And then it came to be, where can we hold a meeting? At that point, Dick and Dorothy were good friends and collaborators. They'd written together. Dick put on his uh, Columbia hat, and Dorothy put on our NYU hat, and it fell apart mm. because I couldn't agree. Physically, I, shouldn't a place like this be exactly in the middle no, no, of the no, way? No, 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 no. <laughs> no it wait, shouldn't be wait, anywhere. in the fridge. Exactly. So, I, so it, 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 six months later, I figured out how to do it. The Opera Cafe. <laughs> no, no, not quite. Yes, we, we borrowed boardrooms of law firms oh, oh, and banks. Yeah, yeah, right. And right. they would lay on some coffee or yeah, whatever yeah, 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 and yeah. stick their head in the door yeah, 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 see yeah, what's going brilliant. on. That was brilliant. And that took off. Yeah. And so out of that percolated the idea for MIT for New York. That was the missing link. And people from the Inam Development Administration, PhDs, yeah. were participating in that and gradually it percolated to Bloomberg. So, let me, a couple of things. Uh, on the show, the, the most, the place I've run into this, I have no wisdom here, but the place I've run into this is i core i core structure is that by design, exactly on this issue, they said it's the, there, it's a hierarchical design. There are nodes and there are sites. Okay, the node, structurally, the NSF funds nodes and sites. Nodes get multi-million dollar annual grants, sites get almost nothing, they get blessing. The nodes are three university associations who share in an activity, okay? So I, and I was a faculty director, which means I wasn't hierarchical, I was over here in a, I chaired a committee to oversee the faculty and the training of the faculty of what these people did. The point is the, the nodes in many instances have a lot of trouble functioning. The Berkeley node, Bay Area node, example I call it the Berkeley node. The Bay Area node, for example, functioned okay. The three universities are Berkeley, Stanford, and UCSF. Berkeley, UCSF, Okay, Berkeley, Stanford, nothing. And Stanford took one third the money, and there's a research, there was a component. You know, instruction and research. Berkeley said, we'll do the, uh, Stanford said, we'll do the research. They came to the first meeting of a program, it was a five year program, and said, where's the data? They, they sat back, literally said, we'll evaluate the data. We said, well, there is no data. We're starting the program. Let's design what the data. They said, we'll come back later. This, and essentially, they took the money yeah. and did nothing. This is STDP? No, this isn't STDP. No? Well, no, it's not STDP. It's, a, it's um, because that's the engineering school. Yes. Yeah. Um, it? Well, that would be Tom Byers, right? Yes. So that, it wasn't Tom Myers. It was an academic. I, I course, something is there. Yeah, the but it was, but yeah, but it was an academic. They assigned an academic ladder faculty research mm. person. Anyway, okay. so they've done that. In five years, they've done that. So all I'm trying to say is... I'm curious as to who this is. Yeah, 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 I am too, because I dropped the book. Because <laughs> okay. I'm not responsible for that node, so I didn't worry about it. But I just saw that... Yeah. I, I went to the first meeting and saw it happen and said... Yeah. The hell with it. But uh, all I'm saying is this, this, this multi-university, even when it comes with $2 million on the table, operating money, not endowment, right. and you're dividing it up, even then... They will each one work on their own. The, the scissors come out. Yes. So um, that's why we have to be very careful yes. about this building. Look, the only reason for the building is I, to save the library. Yeah, I understand. Okay? I, understand. I don't want to see this other... 25 million tear the guts out of the reading room. It will anyway. It always will win. I know. Well, look at maybe. Uh, no, no, I'm all for you. God bless you. Anyway, you save it. The reading room. But you know what? Look, this guy, saved, wants, this guy wants to paint. Turn this. Off. The guy wants to. <laughs> really seriously. Yeah. The guy wants to paint pictures of on 